And now, from beyond our dimension, this is the Jeff Mara Podcast. Here's Jeff. My guest is Bobby Scott, intuitive empath, who is given a choice during his near-death experience. Bobby, thank you for joining me and welcome. Hi, Jeff. I appreciate the invite. Uh, I guess we're going to start on the day itself. Is that correct? Yeah, let's start right on the day your NDE happened and go from okay. there. It happened just shy of my 20th birthday. So as you can see from the gray beard, that was a bit ago. At the time, I was a Lance Corporal in the Marine Corps. We were stationed, uh, temporarily stationed at Coronado Naval Weapons Special Warfare Center doing what's called rubber raft training, where Marines trained to paddle rubber rafts from the ocean onto the beach and capture beach or and then go inland. And it's really rugged training. Uh, you're running around with basically a 550 pound raft, both with equipment over your head all day long. They're 10 man rafts uh, up and down the beach, in and out. And on the last day of that training exercise, uh, it happened at nighttime. It was unusually cold for uh, November in San Diego. And the surf was terrible. They were, um, they were breaking right on the shore. They were shore breakers that were about five, six feet. And so after we got dropped off about a thousand yards offshore, we paddled in and everything was going smoothly till we got close to the shoreline. And when we got to the shoreline, every raft up and down the beach got flipped. So men and equipment in the water. Uh, it was very cold. And then by the time we got the rafts onto the beach and collected all our equipment and um, waited for everybody to get ready for the signal to attack. We laid on that beach for close to an hour. And I know myself, I, it felt like my muscles and tendons were being torn from the bone just because I was shaking so hard. And up and down the line, about a half a dozen guys did get hauled off the hospital for uh, hypothermia, but or hypothermia. Uh, I made it through the entire exercise. We went back to the base took a shower, had a little bit of bite to eat. And my girlfriend lived not too far away in Point Loma. So I drove over to her house. And when I walked in the door, I felt terrible. I just felt absolutely beat. And when she looked up, she's like, what's the matter, Bobby? I go, I just feel terrible. I'm going to bed. And then I went in the bedroom, climbed between the sheets. And have you ever had that experience where you're just so tired when you lay down to go to bed, it feels like the mattress cradles you, like it's giving you a hug. That's how it, oh God, it felt so good. I lay down the mattress, but instead of it catching me, it was like I just fell right through it. Um, and my consciousness left the body. And the next thing I knew after that feeling of falling was a feeling of soaring through space so fast, but no resistance. There was no buffeting of wind or anything like that. It was just a sensation of incredibly fast movement towards a pearlescent colored orb. It was kind of roiling, like if you've ever seen close-up images of the sun, but it was smoother than that. It was kind of a gold pearlescent color. And it suddenly dawned on me that this wasn't normal. And I wondered to myself, what's happening? And at that moment, a presence showed up and it said, you would call it dying. In just a moment, you're going to have to make a decision. If you go on into the light, you will not be returning to your body. And it, I would have thought that would have scared me, but it, it didn't at all. I had This was the first time in my life I felt pain-free. Uh, it was like this orb was radiating this sense of wellness and well-being. And um, for the first time in my life, I just felt so good. It, it was really tempting to go on into light. But the next thing that happened was, it was like I was given a taste of my life up till that time. I've heard of people saying they've had past life reviews. It wasn't like that for me. It was, it was the equivalent of getting a glass of something and tasting it, and it just tasted unfinished. And then I heard a voice say, no, I have to go back. I have way too much left to experience. Now, the strange thing was I still had a, a body, a, a light body. Uh, the presence that showed up also had a light body, but it was dreamlike, not, um, not solid, if you know what I mean. Um, and this, But this voice 
wasn't either and it didn't show up in a body. It just said, no, I have way too much left to accomplish. I have to go back. And I accepted that as my answer because it kind of felt like my soul answering on my behalf. And initially, my momentum just kept roaring into this beautiful orb. After I, And then I started like intending to stop, intending to go back. And at one point, it was like, you know, rubber bands caught up to the action that all of a sudden I started to slow real quick. And then these rubber bands slam me right back into my body. And what I remember more than anything was that feeling of my fingers popping back in and my lips popping back in. And I slammed it in my body hard enough that I sat right up in bed. And, and when I looked around, it was so strange because at that time, or by that time, my girlfriend was in bed next to me. She was sleeping. The room was entirely dark. It was just kind of like the sound of crickets. But the moment I was back in the body, I was back in the pain. And I, I felt devastated that I made a choice to come back because, you know, for that few moments that I was outside of the pain was so amazing. Being back in it now, it was even worse because juxtaposed against that, that sense of peace that I knew now knew was possible, uh, being back in the body felt like hell. So initially I felt really sad, but then I, I just felt really angry at myself for having made that choice. Um, but there were a couple of things that really changed me during that. From that point forward, I knew I was a spiritual being having a human experience and not the other way around. I was no longer confused about that at all. But the second thing that I realized, I, I just would, I would never fear death again. Uh, when it comes, I'll welcome it, but it's not. I'm not chasing it. Uh, and a big reason for that, prior to that experience, I started contemplating suicide when I was 10. Life was pretty painful for me. Um, and that, that continued on uh, after that near-death experience. I, I had those thoughts a lot, but I, I just was never going to act on those thoughts. Because I'd made a commitment to return, there was some purpose in my return. I didn't know what it was. I didn't have a clue. So it was really just a matter of taking one step after another. And then this is not part of the, the near-death experience, but you know, keep in mind, I'm, I'm, an, I'm almost 20 at this time. I'm really young. Um, and about six months later, I got transferred to Okinawa, and I had a series of dreams over three months. And when I would wake up in the morning, it was like I could kind of remember the dreams, but not really until the final dream. And this was a really a strange one where, and keep in mind, these are dreams are metaphorical, okay? not to be taken literally, although I might have taken this just a little bit too literally. Um, the final dream, I dreamed of who the antichrist was going to be. And I'm not saying that I believe in that. I'm just saying it happened in the dream. And when I woke up from that dream, I I knew I would it was actually uh, a, a female face. And I but it, when I woke up, it was like a police blotter had blotted out her face. But I knew if I ever saw that image, um, I would recognize it right away. And Again, six months later, I got transferred to Paris Island, where I was a drill instructor in the Marine Corps. So the worlds are just so strange. On the one hand, I'm having these really strange spiritual experiences. And on the other end, you know, I'm this hard-charged Marine who's pretending not to be this other thing. Um, and we were, I was back in the lounge one day, and there was a People magazine sitting on the table. And... I just picked it up because I had nothing better to do. And I started leafing through it. And all of a sudden, over on this page, I see this picture of a woman. And I'm like, oh, my God, that's the woman from my dreams. And then I start reading the article. It's about a woman running for political office in Brazil who supposedly can control the weather and is the eighth in a line of beings, Jesus of Nazareth, having been the seventh. And it just scared the crap out of me. And I slammed that magazine together. And I set it on that table. And I walked away. And that was exactly as my dreams had predicted, that for six years, there was going to be basically nothing except life, and really a lot of painful life. Um, but after six years, something 
something was going to take place. So that something that took place was uh, I came home from work one day. I had two young kids, a three-year-old and a one-year-old. I was in a marriage where both of us had our emotional challenges and we took those challenges out on each other. So we didn't bring out the best in each other. We brought out the the worst. And I came home from work one day to an empty apartment. My children were gone. Almost all the furniture was gone. There was a couple sticks of furniture left and a few books laying on the ground. And again, it was another one of those devastating life experiences that just felt like it cut my heart out because I, I adore my children. And I leaned down and reached for one of the books. I picked it up and it was Shirley MacLaine's Dancing in the Light. And I started reading it and I couldn't put it down because for the first time in my life, I saw I wasn't alone. I'm not the only one who's having these kinds of experiences. And really that's what kicked off this spiritual quest to to know the truth of me and the truth of life. So I kind of, we can step off at any point now. I just wanted to give you a little background in terms of, you know, that, that flow of that life, that these experiences were happening. Um, I couldn't deny what was happening through these experiences. And yet I'm still trying to pretend to fit into the normal world. Before we move forward, let me clear up a few things and ask you some questions. Okay. When you were on the other side, you first encountered an orb, and then you encountered a presence. So these were two separate beings? No, the orb was more like a sun. It was huge. It was, it was, a, it was like a massive sun, except that, like I say, it was like a pearlescent color. Kind of and kind of goldish, um, but it I don't know what it was because I didn't fly into it. Um, what I could tell was it it was radiating this energy that just felt amazing, all right. And the communication came from the presence that offered you the choice, yes. All right, do you think that the orb was possibly like God or something, just radiating love and and peace and energy? That would be conjecture on my part. I I don't know. Um, It had that feeling. You know, it was like, you know, if you said, hey, would you lean one way or the other? I'd say, yeah, it felt like a return to the all. What I find fascinating is the presence asked you if you wanted to go or stay, but you didn't answer. Perhaps your higher self answered for you. I've wondered about that. Um, at the time, it, it, it's I just recognize that after, if I hadn't tasted, had that taste of my life, and it, if it hadn't tasted unfinished, I probably would have gone into the light. But having tasted that, the voice just reaffirmed what I what I had tasted. So I recognized that answer as my own, even though I didn't speak it and it didn't seem to originate from it within me. So yeah, the feeling was that my soul had answered on my behalf. Who do you think the presence was? I have no idea. None. Uh, it's the same. It feels like the same presence that's been a part of my life for a long time. Um, what the first time that I actually felt it, I was 10 years old and I was at a Catholic retreat. And it was probably the third day of the retreat. And at one point in the early afternoon, the, the parish priest sent all the kids out. There were about 25, 30 kids, about five adults, plus the parish priest. And I think it was around our time that we were doing confirmation in Catholicism. And the priest said, go outside and contemplate God. It's in the the woods in central Michigan, it's the middle of winter. There's two feet of snow on the ground. It's a, it's blue outside, a blue sky outside. And so for me as a 10-year-old, I couldn't wait to get out of that center. I charged back and threw on my boots and my pants and my, you know, heavy jacket and my hat and my scarf and my mittens. And I was the first one out the door. And as soon as I charged out the door, the first thought occurred to me was, 
I don't have to contemplate God. Look at this. Because the, the trees have been dusted with snow. The, you know, the pine trees all had a, about an inch or two of snow laying on top of them. The birch trees, it had had a freezing rain the day before. So there was like lines of icicles all the way down the branches. And they reflected the sun. So they, they literally looked like sparkling light trees out there. And there was a little bit of ice on top of the snow. So that was sparkling and glistening too. So kind of looked like a trillion diamonds just sparkling and glowing. And I didn't have any problem out there contemplating God because I just played. I was doing pirouettes and doing the stuff you would expect a really happy 10-year-old kid to do. And at one point, I suddenly noticed that it was getting dark and I look around it. I don't know where I am. I'm completely lost. And there's forest for miles in every direction. So I decided I'm going to turn around and follow my footprints back to the retreat center. And pretty soon I just see I'm just walking over old footprints, over old footprints. And I realized they're just going in a circle because that's how I walked out there. I just walked in circles. And so I went in one direction and then I went in another direction. And by that time, my hands and feet were hurting pretty good because it was cold out. And it had gotten, I'd say pitch black, but there was a moon out. So it wasn't totally pitch black. There was some light. And I plopped down in the side of a snowbank and I thought to myself, God, how am I going to get back? And I hear a voice clear as a bell, stand up, turn around and walk to the top of the hill. I didn't think about it. I stood up, I turned around, I walked to the top of the hill and pretty far off in the distance, I see the lights of the retreat center. And that's how I found my way back. And if I had gone, and this didn't dawn on me at the time, a uh, little 10 year old mind, but when I reflected back on it, if I had gone in any other direction, I wouldn't be here today. It was the only direction that took would have taken me back to that retreat center. So I was the last one to get back there. All the kids were telling stories about their experience. When it got to me, I shared that story. And the adults in the parish priest looked at me like I was some kind of a misfit or a monster or a liar and they made me feel so small and so insignificant that it i made a decision for myself that there's something wrong with me um and so i and i live with that decision for quite some time so that was the first time that i heard that voice the second time was in that near-death experience and then there was a third time, which happened about eight years after that near-death experience, when that, that voice really introduced itself for the first time. And it happened through a, a series of meditations over three nights. And the first night, um, I, I was regularly meditating at the time. It was I was fairly new to the process, maybe I had been meditating for a couple of years, no formal training. I would just bring my attention and awareness right up behind my ears and, and breathe, just follow my breath as it moved in and out and allow whatever happened to happen. Well, this time, after I got into that kind of a quiet space, uh, I a vision starts happening. And I'm, I'm not a particularly visual person. I'm really kinesthetic. So it was unusual seeing something so, so real. And in this vision, I was walking down a dirt road um, that it was really a pretty area. It was hilly, uh, lots of different types of trees. And when I got down to the bottom of this road, um, it was a like a, a T intersection. I turned to the right, which was the way that led into the city. And I knew that I was there as a, a newspaper man who was there to write a story about a woman who was purportedly a witch. And I'm kind of dressed like what I would imagine newspaper people at the time were, you know, wearing kind of a rumpled suit and shoes that didn't have a lot of polish on them and a fedora on my head and a tie that was a little bit loose. And I find my way into the, the city. And as I'm walking in, this 1920s era pickup truck drives by me. And it was a Ford pickup truck. Um, and at that point, I stop and I ask, or I, I just think to myself, where am I? And that voice says, 
and actually at this point, I don't remember. It's either Vilnius or Vilnius. And I'll get to that in a second. It's a, it's a city in Lithuania. I didn't know that at the time. When I finally got to this uh, woman's place of business, I realized, well, it's an apothecary. She's not a witch. She's, she's an herbalist. So there's herbs hanging down from the ceiling and tucked into every nook and cranny. And she has her back turned to me when uh, I first walk in, long red hair, slender. And when she turns around, I see it's somebody I know in this lifetime. Now, the strangest thing is her nickname in this lifetime is, and this happened after the fact. This wasn't her nickname then. It was her son later on who gave her this name, is Witchy Woman. And she is actually became an herbalist a little bit later in life, which I just found um, kind of an aside, but it was it was interesting. But again, it it didn't mean a lot. But since I heard the name, and I believe it was Vilnius was the name that I heard. So I went down to the library the next day, pulled out the card catalog. Yep, sure enough, there is a city named Vilnius. I went to that part of the library. Um, I pulled a, a book off the shelf at random. I flipped it open. And when I, I looked at it, I'm, I'm, I opened it to a page where there was a full map on the left and on the right page. On the left side was a map of Lithuania before 1936. And I believe at that time, the name of the city was Vilnius. And then after 1936, the city had been renamed by the Germans when they took over the city in World War II, and it was renamed Vilnius. And it meant nothing to me aside from the fact that, yeah, a city like that did exist, but I didn't know what it meant. And at the time, I was looking for answers, not bullshit. I, I was so lost and so confused, I needed a compass, and this wasn't helping at all. So I went home pretty upset next night or that same night, the next night, which is the night I'd gone or that night when I'd gone to the library the first time, I started having a second vision. And in this case, it was a Native American that came to see me and, and he reached out and grabbed my hand and it was like he pulled me to where they live. It was in southeastern Arizona. And, and on our way there, I saw this region from overhead. And, and then I said, well, uh, what nation are you from? And he says, Chiricahua. And I hadn't heard of Chiricahua. So again, the next morning, with that information, I go down the library. Sure enough, Chiricahua's lived in southeastern Arizona. Um, I go to that stack in the library. I pull a, a random book off the, the bookshelf. I open it up. In the upper left-hand corner is a picture of the man I saw that came to me in that vision, sitting next to Geronimo by a fire, by a campfire. And on the right side was an overhead picture of southeastern Arizona that looked exactly like I had seen it from overhead. And again, I saw this. I realized that, okay, so, so what? This and two bucks still won't buy me a cup of coffee. What good is this to me? So I left even angrier and more frustrated than I was the day before. And that night when I got home, or that later that night when I sat down to meditate, I start having a vision again. And I can't, and I realize something's trying to show me something. Something's trying to communicate with me. And I just, I'm like, what, what? What are you doing? Why is this happening? And this voice says, because you still need confirmation. And I was like, oh, my God, that's so true. I have doubted this faculty for so long. And the next words were, what do you need? And I knew what I needed um, because I'd been worried about it. Uh, it was a Sunday. The next Saturday, all my bills were due. I had... $37 left in my account. I couldn't pay him. I said, I need money. And it said, how much? I said, $1,600. It said, you know that ring you have in your drawer? And I knew what it was. It wasn't a question. It was a statement. It was a ring that was returned to me from an engagement that had been broken off. I had tried to sell that ring for so much less than it was worth wasn't able to, so I just threw it in that drawer and forgot about it. 
So I said, you know that ring in the drawer? And I did. I said, put an ad in the newspaper on Tuesday for $1,700. The ad will appear on Thursday and you will get what you need on Saturday. Like, all right. So I call up to place the ad on Tuesday. At $37 left in my account. Cost $36 to place the ad. So it's an all-in bet. I place the ad, it shows up on Thursday. I get a couple of callers. I get one on Friday who says, you know, can I take the ring out and get it appraised without you being there? And I'm like, yeah, yeah, goodbye. And then Saturday morning, I wake up in a terror because it's the last day the ad is going to run. I'm dead broke. All the bills are either due or past due, including rent, my car payment, the child support, and every other bill I have. And about, I probably wake up at nine, 10 o'clock, the phone rings. And it sounds like a kind of a young girl on the other end. And she said, do you still have the ring? I said, yeah. She goes, I don't have um, $1,700. I only have $1,600. Would you take that? I said, yeah. She goes, I'll see you in about an hour. And again, inside, I'm still churning. I'm still worried. She shows up an hour later, knocks on the door. Can I see the ring? I show her the ring. She goes, that's beautiful. Reaches in her purse, pulls out $1,600, hands it to me, and leaves. I never see her again. Doesn't have the ring appraised. It's like, this is just, it is, it is just so far out there. But what that became for me was a touchstone that when things got difficult going forward and when things got scary and when I was walking into uncertainty, I could always step back to that moment and realize that as scary as it was, everything still, still turned out okay. So that became a wonderful touchstone for me. So that's kind of that, that whole story from beginning to end. Do you think that at least the first vision was actually a past life? No. I don't believe in anything out there. I only believe... Now, let's make have this make sense. And I guess to have it make sense, I'll just share a different story. I got to a point finally, so after my inner voice introduced itself, I also met a wonderful teacher in my life who taught me a couple of wonderful practices that were very helpful in like scraping away the first layers of like a lot of the, the mental impediments that kept me from going out in the world, you know, those things that hold us back in fear, right? So um, 10 years after that, I was finally at a place where I was, I was just tired of letting fear rule my life. And I got to a point where I said to spirit, uh, I, I was meditating and I got myself in that calm place. And I said, I'm tired of having fear rule my life. I don't care what you do to me. Go ahead and blow me up. It doesn't matter. I have to know what's possible. Show me. And it was, uh, it is strange how when you get to that place of such determination, life seems to respond to it. Um, and the very next day when I sat down to meditate again, I got to that quiet space and I, I hear that voice. Now the voice, when I ask, what's, who are you? I hear I am, or I am that, or I am that I am. It just is. And it's it's not a personality, it's a we. It's a it's a collective. Um, but the next day it says you and I are one. And when it does that, all these voices erupt in my head, all those thoughts like. That's blasphemy. That's crazy. That's not possible. Blah, 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 blah. And after a few minutes, they kind of all die down, settle back into the muck. And when that happens, that same voice, you and I are one. Boom. All those thoughts come flying up again. That's crazy. That's nuts. You're insane. That's blasphemy. Blah, 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 blah. 
They all settle back down again. And the third time it was a little bit different. It says, you and I are one. This time, ask those voices to identify themselves and follow them to their source. So all those voices arise, and I would say, who are you? And they would go, I am you. It's like, well, I know you're not me because I'm observing you. So I know you're pretending to be me, but you're not me. And when I follow them to their source, they all just kind of dith- disappeared into the nothingness from which they came. None of it was real. And after I did that, I found myself in this really strange, quiet space where I still had my own individuated identity, but I also had consciousness of all of it. And I said, but I was perceiving it through the individuated identity. And so I said, well, if you and I are one, why don't I perceive as you perceive? How come I'm not omnipotent and um, you know all-knowing and all-seeing? And Spirit said, you could have that right now. Just say the word and it will be so. And in that moment, I was enveloped by this incredible matrix of light. And they were like, a bunch of individual stars all tied together by these little lines of light. So it was was literally like a webbing, like a matrix. And when I looked at it, it, it was not a thinking thing. It was like the moment I saw it, I realized, oh, these are all the stories I can live. These are all the possibilities. And it, it was endless. It went in every direction. I could also see that I'm living in like this story up here. And I realized to go from one story to the next, it wasn't a matter of doing, it was shifting something inside me. And if I shifted something inside me, I would just automatically be perceiving through another story, right? We're always perceiving life through our perceptual lenses, through our stories. And and when I saw this, these words spilled out of my mouth. Again, I didn't think them. It's like, oh, It's like we tell ourselves a giant story, buy into a hook, line, and sinker, and then we get to live out the stories we tell. And in that moment, I realized, oh, so it's it's not, I'm not the problem. Life isn't the problem, because up until that moment, I hated being alive. I hated being human. I didn't like anything about this place. And in that moment, I had a radical change of heart, I realized oh my God, I actually do want to be here. I chose to be here. I don't want my story to end. So I asked what became the driving, a question that became the driving force of my life for the next 25 years. So how do I change the story if I don't like the one I'm currently living? And I was shown something at that time that I really didn't, I kind of understood, but not really. Do you know what a cylinder looks like with a piston? right? Kind of. Okay. So what I saw was it was a cylinder, but it was solid. It was, it was, there was no outlet and a piston was put into it. And as the piston began to be pressed down, the pressure inside the the cylinder built up to the equivalent pressure being exerted. And it finally got to a point where no matter how much force was exerted on this piston, it would never close the gap. And then a valve appeared in the bottom of the the cylinder. It was open. It let the pressure out. And you could push that piston closed with one finger. And so I realized it had something to do with like letting go, like eliminating the obstacles. Once you eliminate the obstacles, what you want is there. But it was a much longer process of, of really understanding that what I was to eliminate were all the inner obstacles, the thoughts, the armor that I created around my chest, resolving all the misperceptions that I had been living with, and really letting go of everything that I was not until I I finally was able to live from that place inside myself that I love. And when when you live from that space of love inside yourself, you become what I call a values directed person. But I'm not talking about values in the way it's taught in most places, you know, where people fill you up with what your values are supposed to be. 
what in in my way of expressing values, what your values are your why. So if you think of something you really want, let's just say, you know, I, I want to win the lottery. And you ask yourself, why? Why do I want to live? What would feel so good? What is my inner experience now that I've won the lottery? And I I had this experience once myself where I was driving out to a customer's house and I was so angry because they'd been running me ragged. And I and I and I don't remember if it was my inner guidance that said, what do you want? Or if it was just me saying, maybe I should change up my mind here a little bit. I go, what would you love, Bobby? What would you love to experience? Oh, I love to experience the, the lottery. I love to win the lottery. When I asked why, my body just took a deep breath. And I was like, oh, my God, I just feel so in relief. And I realized what I wanted was relief. And I didn't have to win the lottery to get it. All I had to do was think about that I'd already won the lottery and I felt relief. But the way that changed me was if I hadn't recognized this on the drive out to the customer's house, when I got there, I discovered a husband and wife arguing because the wife wanted to get a car and the husband didn't. And I probably would have tried to stick around and help them resolve that argument. But I was like, I want relief. I said, why don't you guys settle your argument? Give me a call when you figure it out. And I drove back to work and it was like, I felt so good because I realized I wanted relief way more than I wanted money. So that's kind of what I mean by being a values directed person. But we're now we're coming back to that kind of that day after. I, I realized that I'm, I'm going to start letting go of stuff. So the first thing I let go of, at least at that time, was I let go of drinking. I let go of some other bad habits. I incorporated more good habits into my life. But about maybe three years down the road, somebody came up and they were a, a past life regressionist. And they said, I'd really like to do a past life regression for you. Would you be open to it? I go, sure. So uh, we went to, this was at a hotel. We went to their hotel room, sat down. And this was the second time somebody had come up and done that for me. Both times didn't go the least bit as they expected, but both times were really impactful for me. And in this case, um, the way they usually start off is they have you imagine walking down a set of stairs in your mind. And that just didn't work. It, nothing happened. So the regression says, well, what are you experiencing? I said, nothing. And I really meant that. I wasn't experiencing anything. It was like it was an absolute darkness. And he said, well, let's see where this takes us. And after a few moments, the strangest thing was nothing existed, and then a breeze came up, and suddenly I existed in relationship to that breeze. Before the breeze, I didn't exist. It was like I came to existence on that breeze, and that feeling was um, amazing. And then the next thing I saw was this outline of a bird draw itself around me. And this kind of goes back to answer that question you had asked earlier. The moment that outline was drawn, I perceived myself to be everything inside the white line. And everything outside the white line was other. So just with those first two things, with that feeling and that white line, suddenly I existed and other existed and feeling and sensation existed. It was like, well, this is pretty cool. And once I had those wings or that bird drawn around me, I could, I could like do this and I could feel that pressure on the wings. And suddenly a long ways off, I saw light. So I turned my wings in the direction of that light. And as I approached, I saw it was this constellation, but I was massive. I, I wrapped my whole being around the constellation and in doing so, I would experience myself as whatever, whatever that light was. And there was suddenly lights everywhere. And I'd fly over and I'd wrap myself around them. And I'd have that experience. And I'd fly over and do another one. And I'd have that experience. And all of a sudden, I woke up in a vision of myself being a raven on a telephone wire sitting outside a farmhouse. And it was 
it appeared to be like 1930s Dust Bowl area. Everything was gray and lifeless. There was just dust billowing and um, oh, what do you call those dead tumbleweeds tumbling along. And everything was in disrepair. There was a little white farmhouse. Well, it was a farmhouse covered with dust, you know, thick dust where it kind of all looked a bit dead. And I looked in through an open window and there was a man slumped over his table. And I could see from my perspective that this man was suffering intensely. But I had no, I, I didn't know what that was. I had, I couldn't empathize with him because I didn't have that capacity to empathize with him. So I knew what it was, but I didn't really know anything about it. So I went up and I wrapped my wing, wings around that man and then everything went dark and that experience ended. And it wasn't until 25 years later or so, after, after shedding all these, I'll just call them misperceptions, all the misperceptions I had about life. And it was a journey that felt like failure like failure over and over and over and over and over again. And, but 25 years later, when I look back, I just started laughing because I saw how on purpose it all was. There, it was no accidents along the way that every perceived failure was just a new beginning. That old part wasn't needed anymore. Something new was, but that transition from the old to the new can be really scary and difficult because we leave the known for the unknown. And that does get a bit scary. But 25 years later, when I look back and I had just come through an experience, uh, do, we, do I have time to tell this story? I think so. We got about 20 minutes left. So again, I, I learned through my experiences. So that's my process. And, and really what my work is, is about uh, sharing with people the skills that are required to learn and grow through the difficulties, we, you know, through adversity. Because we don't need education about how to enjoy the easy times, do we? Those are really easy to enjoy. It's the difficulties that cause all our, all our emotional challenges, and they often turn into physical challenges and mental challenges. So that's the part of life that we need to become skilled at. Right. So we're spiritual beings having a human experience and learning to be fully human, which may be the most difficult job in the universe, because being human isn't always easy. I think we can all agree about that. So I finally got to this experience or this experience where. See if I can remember what led me to it. Well, what always initially leads me to it is I feel a disturbance inside myself. Whatever that disturbance is, you could call it upset, right? Anger, worry, and whatever, whatever that, you know, discontent inside is. And oh, now I do remember. And when I felt into it, my my process is I asked, uh, who are you? Because me, the like the real me, I am that raven. I'm nothing. I'm empty, but inside me is everything. So when I feel a disturbance, I know it doesn't belong to me. It belongs to something inside of me. So I reach out. Who are you? And it says, your heart. And I thought I was fooling myself because I had seen various aspects of my heart, but I'd never, my heart had like never reached out in the just totality to say anything to me. When I say my heart, I'm talking about the heart of me, the heart of the child within. And I, I said, you're my heart? It was like, yes. I go, well, what do you need? It said, and it was, it was such a deep sadness. It says, I'm broken. And it didn't mean that I'm broken in terms of heartbroken. It meant I can't trust my own perceptions. And as somebody who is heart driven, if you can't trust your primary way of knowing, how can you live life in any way that would resonate with your deepest desires? Because you don't trust the one thing that can take you there. 
And so I said, what? It says, I'm broken. I can't trust my own perceptions. And when I'm in those experiences, it's not just like the character. It's the indwelling spirit, me. It's the character. And it's the higher power, too. And so when that when that when my heart said that, my inner knowing says, Oh, love, it's not you. You live in a world that doesn't power, and that's not what you are. You're love. You can tell I can feel it now. Um because it was the same response in my heart then. And it it's a it if it looks like pain, you're misreading it. It's this joy and pain feel really similar. When when you feel those feelings, like joy often starts as pain and then opens up and it becomes um this feeling of ex vibrant expansiveness. And so I just brought my heart through the process. So I, I, I saw what the heart had. Oh, and then it says, it's all my fault. I said, what? It says it's all my fault. And what it was referring to is all the pain that it had suffered. It took the response. It blamed itself for having created it in the first place. And it's like, oh, love, it, it's not your fault. It wasn't you. This is, it's really hard being human. You weren't equipped to, to, for those experiences when you were younger, but I'm here now. I'm here. And my process is always, I'm sorry it took me so long to find you. Please forgive me. I love you. I'm sorry. And, and those inner, because they are children, children respond to that. They respond to love. And it was basically my my heart melted. And in that moment, I finally knew what guilt was. I'd never really been able to distinguish the difference between shame and guilt before. And shame is an embarrassment about the things we've done. And shame says, I am this, right? Whereas guilt says, not only am I that, but it's all my fault. So it's like a multiplier. It's like take all that pain and multiply it by a hundred. That's what guilt does. So in in seeing it, I was in, in the heart seeing it, the heart's willing to let it all go. And I just bring that back into the fold, so to speak, and embrace it with the totality of me. And it becomes part of me. And it's overjoyed like any child is that feels safe and secure and and open to explore their world. It was a it was a radical shift, but as soon as it happened, I remembered that past life experience. That I was curious about the man, and I was curious about that that the nature of his suffering, because I could tell he was suffering greatly, but I didn't know why. But in that moment I did. It wasn't that he'd lost his wife or his farm, or his hopes or his dreams, or his confidence, or his self-respect, or his livelihood, or his money, or any of that. It was that he blamed himself for it all. But it wasn't his fault, right? The Dust Bowl wasn't his fault. He left the East Coast and brought his family out there to make a life for them, to make a home for them, you know, operating in... in with all his highest and best instincts, and it failed. And so our nature as human beings is to blame ourselves for our failures. And I suppose if I was going to like wrap this up a little bit, is that's the first mistake. It's not your fault you're not to blame. And failures are just unexpected outcomes. Failures are endings that may not have turned out as as we hope, because there's something bigger and better and more wonderful down the road. There's a, like, when I first started out, I thought I wanted to create work and life that I loved. And then I realized, and it took a long time, so I'm not saying this is, 
know, there's a big difference between something being simple and it being easy. Hitting a baseball is a simple thing, but it ain't easy. So I thought I wanted to create work in the life that I'd love, something that fed the family and the soul. And later on, I realized, I don't want to create work. I want to create a life I love, a life that feeds the family and the soul. And so, but even more than that, what I, what I really wanted was this experience of life that the way I initially described it was I wanted to feel whole and complete inside, connected to source and at one with all of life. That's how I initially expressed it. Well, later on down the road, I could say that in just one word, which was I wanted to experience union. I wanted to experience union with everything. And that was the day when I switched from thinking about it in terms of these separate experiences to union. All of a sudden, it was like I had the experience of union with this, the heart of the child within, this beautiful heart, this courageous, joyful, uh, curious, wonderful heart of the child within. And I was like, oh, my God, this is the greatest gift in all the universe. This, the, the being that came to earth was empty for all intents and purposes compared to being filled up with the heart of the child within. It, it, I don't know that there's a more wonderful experience in being human. And it doesn't mean you don't go through trials and tribulations, but when, when you do it with that sense of love and curiosity and wonder and letting go of all the, the stuff that's rattling around in your brain, it really, really does change everything. At what point did you become empathic? Always have been. When I had that experience that I mentioned earlier at the retreat, at, at age 10, I did a lot of things, and one was just to shut down. It was too painful. Uh, but that shutting down for me was like going blind. This feeling is how I see. So it it is like I reach out with my being just like that you know, that raven that I told you about, I reach out with my being and wrap around things. And that's how I come to know them through direct experience. So it's always been that way. And when I say intuitive empathic, there's a lot of different types of empaths. Um, you're probably highly intuitive if you're, if you're empathic um, and you have psychic gifts. So I'm, I'm, clear audience, so I hear the guidance. I'm clear cognizant, so I know things that, like when I first start talking to people, I know things that I, ha I have no idea how I know them, but I do. Um, and and clear, clear sentient, which, wait a minute, clear sentient, clear cognizant, clear audience. So clear sentient is that feeling nature, you know, where you feel the truth of things. And I've had clairvoyant experiences, but I don't consider myself a clairvoyant. Um, I don't even think it's important. And I don't mean for people that are clair, uh, clairvoyants that there's something bad or wrong with them. I, I mean, I focus on the here and now and the present moment. And I'm choosing with my values in mind because I know if I consistently choose what I value in the moment, then that then my life will clearly reflect that back to me in time. So it's like investing, right? If peace is what I want, I keep choosing for peace. If joy is what I want, I keep choosing for joy. If understanding is what I want, then I keep choosing for that in the moment. Do you feel that these gifts were a result of your NDE? No. No, I was that before the experience. Did you get any other gifts from your NDE? Well. You can imagine how it might change your perspective when you know beyond a, of a shadow or a doubt that you're the indwelling spirit and not the body. So that shift in perspective was, it, it would prove to be really important later, but not at the time. Because coming back into the body, and hey, listen, let's reach out to your, you know, if, you, if we think out to your audience or reach out to your audience, 
There's nobody out there who doesn't realize how challenging and difficult it can be to be human from time to time. And that pain is in your body. The, the body keeps the story. And so all the internal work, the inner work that, that I do and, or that I share is all done connected really in, when you really embody and you, you allow that feeling process to unfold within yourself. Um, it's sort of like this. A lot of people, when they hear let go, they think they're being told to stop being so emotional or so upset or so angry, but that's not what it means. Let go means let go of the story, breathe and don't resist, right? Let go of the story that's playing in your head, refocus your attention and awareness right behind your eyes and smell the air. This is how you can step into presence. So whenever I find myself, you know, that first spark of upset, that's the first thing I do. I know, oh, I'm telling myself a stupid story. I bring my focus and attention right behind my eyes and I smell the air. If you do that right now, you'll feel just a little bit more present because you've done two things. You've pulled your awareness out of the story and into your body and you're, you're brought your feeling and sensing online, right? Automatically. Once you do that, the next thing to get the mind to go along is I just remind myself that I don't have all the answers, right? That's not hard. Nobody has all the answers. And like just doing those two steps right off the bat, I can automatically feel my, my inner mood calming down just a little bit. And then the last step is that I embrace whatever I'm feeling inside. I let go of the story. I feel the feelings and sensations, and I make peace with how I feel, whether I like the way it feels or not, and without making anybody right or wrong for feeling the way that I do, including me. And, and, and at any time I take those steps, and, and now it's so ingrained, it's just, boom, it just happens, right? But again, to recap, and this is so simple, and anybody out there who just follows along with this, you're going to feel yourself kind of calming down and being much more centered and, and present is pull your awareness out of the mind and put it right kind of behind your eyes and smell the air, right? Feel those sensations coming in. While you're doing that, like on your second breath, okay, I don't have all the answers. Nobody, nobody has all the answers. That's not too tough. And then I listen inwardly and I, I notice how I'm feeling. And I don't use labeling words like, okay, I feel hot, I feel buzzing, I feel tightness, I feel tension, I feel explosive, I feel this. It, it, it's okay that I feel this way. I'm not going to make anybody right or wrong for feeling the way that I do, including me. And that brings me into a state of kind of, even if I'm in inner turmoil, turmoil I, the indwelling spirit, am not present. And I can listen inwardly. And what I'm listening for are my values. Right. I have to know what I want. If it's peace, I listen inwardly and I might just inquire, what would peace have me do? How would peace respond to this moment? If it's joy, what would joy do? How would joy respond to this moment? If it's understanding, I would understand, you know, whatever it is, whatever I want to call forth into the world. I do it through my choice. I do it because I know I want to bring it in the world and then I do it through my actions and choices. And it's it's a repetitive thing. It's over and over again. Get out of the story. Get into your body. Listen. Get out of the story. Get into your body. Listen. Because nobody can tell you who or what to be. You're the secret holder, the secret keeper, and all those secrets are inside our hearts. So it's a matter of, of shedding all the stuff that isn't that, of shedding these incredible misperceptions that we form in our youth, shedding all the armor we build around our hearts. And then really tuning into that heart and, and living from that heart space, you know, where the body becomes the teacher, the heart's the temple, and the mind is the servant. So we've kind of got that backwards right now. Well, you have a book that's coming out called The Empath, Falling in Love with the Heart of the Child Within. What is that book going to be about? Well, the synopsis is some of what you've heard today, right? An all-knowing but unfeeling being incarnates on earth because it wants to understand the depth and nature of human suffering 
and it incarnates along with an intuitive empathic soul and with no memories of what came before. Welcome to Earth. Enjoy your experience. And so the only way to come to know, it, it, it's so strange. It's like it's in that suffering that we become who we are. The purpose of it isn't the suffering. It's the shedding of everything we're not. But we resist that shedding, and that's where the suffering comes in. Right? If we don't resist the suffering, it can be not necessarily easy, but it's pretty simple. I just keep breathing and don't resist. Um, and so I've, I've, I've written four other books, none of which I've spent any time marketing because I knew I wasn't ready. It was more like my journals or my notebooks, so to speak, so I could remember the first book I wrote, I kept in my back pocket for seven years. That's how I that's how I trained myself to begin seeing the eye or seeing the world through the eyes of forgiveness, which just means you can see multiple perspectives at the same time. So you don't get caught up in a single perspective that disagrees with all the other perspectives. And the, the book is going to be a series of stories because I think we learn from each other's stories when we see ourselves in a story. That's wonderful. And what else is wonderful is when we resonate with bits of a story we don't know yet, but we know, right? And it, it's like a seed that then, you know, if it gets the proper conditions, it can grow and manifest into something beautiful. So it's really the stories that I've moved through. And I'm hardly a perfect being, right? Like I say, I made a lot of mistakes. I was hurt and I hurt a lot of people, not on purpose, but that's kind of all part and parcel of being human beings. Misunderstanding and being misunderstood is woven into the fabric of being a human being. So that's the purpose of the book. So pull out whatever you want and make it your own and leave the rest behind. But it's delivered in a format that's, that's enjoyable because, you know, the stories are what happens when you go and live out on the edge. How does a intuitive empath perceive the world slightly different than other people? And it really is for those on the spiritual path. Because almost every I know that's on the spiritual path, they've got those empathic qualities. They sense that there's a life bigger out there than the life that everybody seems to have bought into, which is something I knew young. I didn't see a place for myself out in the world because it, none of it reflected back to me who I was. So... It's really about that. It's it, hopefully it it awakens it awakens those things within other people so that they can begin to see their own light and grow into their own light. So that's what the book is. It's a series of twenty five stories with that intended purpose. Do you have a date when it's going to be published? End of August. All right, great. Do you have anything else that you're working on that you want people to know about? I'm, not, I'm just busy living. So um, my style of life is I wake up in the morning, I take a deep breath, and I start moving. And I just let myself move. And since my mind, body, and spirit are aligned in that movement, those movements tend to, my life keeps getting more beautiful because right now beauty is my highest value. Um, being present is beautiful to me. Being truthful is beautiful to me. Clarity is beautiful. There's like all the things like the spontaneity, freedom, there's just, they all kind of fall under that, that value of beauty for me. And so I wake up into a beautiful life these days. It, it, it didn't come easy. I paid a really heavy price. But my God, it, what I received in return is priceless. So no matter what it costs, it didn't even come close to the value return for living those values. So again, it's you know it's likely you're going to go through a lot of tough times. You're going to get some breathers, and then you're going to go through another spiral up the ladder. Uh, but eventually, and probably many many times over, you keep waking up into a new life where you're a completely different person, living a completely different life. And that's kind of the joy of it. It's not supposed to be easy. 
supposed to be, you fill in the blank. Well, Bobby, after watching this podcast, people may want to reach out to you and ask you questions. Are you open to that? Oh, yeah. The, the best way to reach me at this point, I haven't put up a website yet. I don't have anything online, but you can find me on Facebook at Bob Bloom. And I don't know what the numbers are, but Bob Bloom Phoenix. You'll find me. Feel free to reach out. Say hello. Before we finish up, can you leave us with one last positive message? Trust the process. Bobby, thank you for that message. And thank you for being my guest. Thanks for reaching out, Jeff. Pleasure talking to you. Likewise. Thanks for watching the Jeff Mara podcast. I really appreciate you. Another way to show support is through YouTube memberships. And if you do, there are loyalty badges and other perks depending on your level of membership. All you need to do is click the join button underneath the video to find out more. Thank you for your support.